Good afternoon, everyone. We're here for a delightful treat today. Uh, we have uh, wanted to share a little bit about background introduction to our speaker. Uh, we have Oriana here with Prime Lending, and they have and during a tough market like this, there's a lot of things to help separate ourselves and especially our listings uh, from the many different type of listings that are out there. Because right now we're seeing uh, listings on the rise. We're starting to see that uh, buyers prefer something that's a little bit more move-in ready. And we also have situations in which uh, first impressions, especially of the photos, are really what's attracting people into the open houses and, and looking at the homes. When you have a wide array of options in today's market right now, you kind of want to have that first impression be spot on. You want to have them be able to come in and walk and feel comfortable that this home is a great place to live with bring your families and uh, hopefully not too much work needed. So that's what people want today. The buyers, especially the first time home buyers, the millennials, they don't want to have a headache of fixer uppers or construct contractors that are going to give them outrageous quotes and, and bids. So to appeal to most of the, uh, uh, most of the majority of the buyers that want something more move-in ready. I know Diane, I, I know Oriana has solutions uh, with prime lending. And I also know that uh, she has some great financing options as well, because financing is such a tough obstacle in escrow today. Many buyers are canceling, not necessarily because they don't want the home. It's because the financing is too high. It's the interest rate, it's the points, it's the uh, mortgage, uh, what they call the mortgage insurance that they add on to it if you have less than 20%. So couple all of these factors of this very tough environment that we're, we're dealing with right now, let's try to bring our clients more options to consider. Because maybe they can also, a seller sometimes has a situation where it's like, I wish I, I just remodeled my kitchen and I did some paint. I don't have the funds right now, but I know I can get another $30,000 worth of equity or forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 worth if I do my bathrooms. Now we have a solution to get there. Okay. So that's a little teaser. Oriana is going to share all this still cool stuff about that. I don't know if you want to, anything you want to share, Sylvia, before we bring on our guest speaker. Thank you, Kelvin. Hi, everyone. Everyone here on screen and everyone here on person. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. So I just want to share a fun fact. I know Kelvin um, shared all the serious stuff, but I want to share a fun fact with you. Does anyone here happen to know um, what Ariana is very passionate about, what she likes? I don't expect you to say yes. If you were to look at her, what would you say she's passionate about? Okay, so those of that are present are looking at her and say, hmm, I don't know. If you ask this, what is Sylvia Ramos passionate about? You probably, most of you will say color because I like color, you know. However, I just learned um, that my good new friend now, Ariana, loves Hello Kitty. So with that said, with a Hello Kitty fan, I'm going to have Ariana come up. Welcome her, please. Thank you. Ariana. Ariana. Yeah. Yay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So first, my name is Oriana, Prime Lunding. And I was actually born in Hong Kong, raised in Monterey Park, grew up in the San Gabriel Valley, went to school in Riverside, and began my lending career in 98. That kind of dates me how old I am. <laughs> How young you are. Okay. So why prime lending? Unlike other lenders, we are mortgage only professionals. Banks have all, all sorts of, I guess, insurance, and wealth management to also learn about. With prime lending, all we focus on is mortgage. We have unique and expensive products that help you do sales, simple streamlined loan process, and we have cutting edge technology. About Prime Lending, we were established in 1986. We have 400 plus products, 15 renovation products. We lend in all 50 states. In 2021 production, $22.7 billion funded, 77,000 family served, and we are ranked as top customer service. 97% customer satisfactory, 
4.9 national average star on Google and 23 or 21,000 five-star Zillow reviews. We offer a wide variety of loans, products, conventional, renovation, condo, new construction, jumbo, VA, FHA, 203K, and many different refinancing options. We have the new 21 and 321 buy down as well. We have a unique product mix. Other than your normal bank products, which we have, we also, we also broker certain products out. Like we have the DSCR, the basically the stated income investment purchase or refinance. We have bank statement programs, 12 and 24 months. We have the foreign national program and we have the reno renovation product. So as far as the DSCR investment programs, you qualify just using the subject property's income. We look at nothing else, just that one property. You have to have three months of reserves, loan amounts up to three million. We have the bank statement programs. So we have the 12 month and 24 month borrower prepared profit and loss bank statement for basically for self-employed borrowers. There's no tax returns needed and there's no W-2s needed to qualify. Second homes can qualify and loan amounts up to 3 million. We have the foreign national program. Loan amounts up to 3 million. You don't have to have credit. No credit score is okay. Cash out proceeds can be used towards reserves. And again, loan amount up to 3 million. As far as renovation loans, with a renovation loan, home buyers finances the home purchase plus the cost of the repairs. So it's one application, one approval, one loan closing, one monthly mortgage payment with a fixed rate and optional and required updates allowed. So what can be done on a renovation loan? Everything. I mean, basically you could have one remaining wall, you could do room additions, you could upgrade everything, new plumbing, new everything basically. You could add square footage. Renovation loans, benefits to agents. You could list a home sooner, you sell them faster, no need to do repairs to sell a home. Sellers don't need to make or pay for the repairs. It's all into the loan and you don't pay on it until it's done. You overcome a lot of the challenges and you make the properties more marketable. You increase the number of potential buyers and it's great to use in the market with limited inventory. Here at Prime Lending, we work together so we could give everybody a positive impact. And that's it, actually. Thank you. If I can help you with anything, just let me know. Yes. Yes. Well, with, with regular conventional loan, it's full documentation. Mm -hmm. So you, we need your basic items, your two years of tax returns, two years of W-2s, current paycheck stubs. But you could actually apply online. I have a button on my signature line and you apply. Everything comes to me. I pull credit. And while we're doing all that, they send the VOE directly to your employer. Um, they go through the work number, so I get the VOE right away. And if you give permission and everything, we could actually, you don't have to give me bank statements, they check it right right away. Mm -hmm. So it's a streamlined process. So uh, what about 
All right. Good afternoon, everyone. We are back. Thank you for being with us and sticking around as we got set up. Because our second double header of today's training, we over have Shelly over here. A uh, special treat for us and all, all of us realtors because she represents the compliance department with CRMLS. And we all know we all want to stay and avoid, comp uh, avoid violations or warnings and all of that stuff. And there is people behind the scenes, believe it or not, not robotic, who review, who understand, who actually try to get realtors to cooperate, try to, to understand with all the new their cooperation policy, all of the new mandates that we are in compliance as when we're presenting and publicizing our listings. So accuracy is always of information and data is always the goal with CRMLS. I totally understand what it's like to go through the process of a warning violation or a fine. And it's not necessarily, everyone takes it personally, but they're just people trying to understand and uh, have regulations on the rules that are in place. And hopefully with your understanding and your uh, great awareness of what to look for when you put out your listings, uh, it's really just to, it's for the public to help them understand what is uh, a good property and not over, uh, over disclosing too much stuff on the property and staying within the rules. You know, talk about the property, talk about what your commissions are offered. And this is a great opportunity for you realtors, those of you at home, or if you're here in our audience live to ask questions to CRMLS compliance. How do I avoid this? What are the common things that realtors are, are messing up on? And uh, to help us become better professionals. So without further ado, uh, I have Sylvia and, and, and uh, Shelly over here going ahead to speak and talk to us about some common violations. Thank you, Kelvin. Again, thank you everyone for being here. Really appreciate you. On um, the last session, I didn't mention and I wouldn't have a meeting without mentioning this. You know the slogan, an agency that cares and an office with a lot of heart. So with that said, I'm very proud and honored to present to you, as Kelvin mentioned, Shelly. Shelly is a very um, uh, important person for all of us. We want to be on her good side. We do not want to be on her bad side. She's the one that keeps us all in compliance and we want to stay in compliance. We want to keep our industry um, clean and we want to be better advocates and ambassadors for our clients. And in order to do that, we need to do things right. And that's why she's here in person. And um, I want to share a fun fact about her. So Shelly likes peacocks. So interesting enough, with Shelly liking peacocks, our office mom here, Mary, has a great friend that does origami art pieces. So we have this great art piece here in the office, which is a peacock. So as part of her parting gift after she's done, took a photo of her with this beautiful peacock. And, and hopefully she'll always remember us that, you know, we're the, we're the good ones. We're the good people. Thank you. And with that, Shelly, it's all yours. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Shelly Walsh. I'm one of the supervisors in the compliance department at CRMLS. Um, I handle all of our research and education. So my job is to maintain the accuracy of the compliance section of our website and also to go out and educate um, agents and our members on how to avoid violations. So I am going to go ahead and get started. All right, got it. Okay, so we have a ton of information on our website regarding compliance. Any question you have could use, is probably going to be able to be answered on our website. Um, so our website address is go.crmls.org. And then you're going to see this screen here. So you're gonna click on that compliance button. And when you click on compliance, it's gonna take you into a whole new world. And um, you're gonna find all sorts of good information in there. You're gonna find um, frequent, frequently asked questions. You're going to find a full set of our rules and regulations, our citation policy, uh, all different forms. I'm gonna be mentioning some different forms during the course of the presentation. So this is where you would locate forms. 
Um, there's also something in here called knowledge base and it's just a button. So you click on knowledge base and it pops up a search bar and any question that you have, any topic that you have, you can go to knowledge base, type in uh, just a few words of what your question is. And most likely you're going to find some information about it there. Most important thing that you can find under the compliance section of our website is the link to our live chat. So we do not have an inbound phone line to the compliance department um, because we sometimes end up dealing with some legal issues. So everything has to be in writing with us. So if you wanna communicate with this compliance department, the best way to do it is via live chat. And we're there during the, the majority of the business day. So Monday through Friday, um, 8.30 to four is our live chat. So that's how you reach our compliance department. So a little bit about our rules. Um, we do get asked where our rules um, come from. And initially our rules are based on model rules that were developed between CAR and NAR. And then there's additional rules that are proposed by the CRMLS Rules Committee. So CRMLS is the nation's largest MLS. So we have 110,000-ish uh, members and we have 41 associations that are members to us. So the MLS Rules Committee is made up of one member from each of those 41 associations and they collectively form the Rules Committee. Um, so they get together, they discuss potential new rules, they discuss revisions to existing rules, they discuss maybe removing some rules, changes. Um, and once they have enough put together, they then pr um, propose it to our board of directors, our CRMLS board of directors. And they are the ones that ultimately vote on and enact our rules. So the compliance department, we don't create the rules, we just um, enforce the rules that are given to us. Okay, so here is a screenshot of our citation policy. If you were to go in our, on our website and look at it, this is just a portion of it, but basically it's broken down into three sections. The first section is the rule number. Second section is whether or not the rule comes with a warning. The third section is a summary of the rule. And then the fourth section is the fine amount in the event that you are found to be in violation. So this fine amount would be attached to the citation that you um, ultimately hopefully don't, but you, if you were to receive one. So if a rule does come with a warning, we're going to send an email to you and we are going to ask you to do one of two things. Either go into your listing and make a correction that we have found to be in potential violation, or we're gonna ask you to provide additional documentation to us for review so that we can determine if a violation has actually taken place or not. We give you two days to either change, uh, make a correction to your listing or to um, provide us with the additional documentation. If nothing is done, we don't hear from you at all, we will move forward and issue you a citation. If it is a warning, if it's a rule that does come with a warning and we issue you a citation, within that citation, we're still going to ask you to make the correction to your listing or to provide us with the documentation. So we're gonna give you an additional um, two days to please do so. If you choose not to do so again, We'll get into that. It actually falls under one of our rules where you will be issued a second citation, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So if you are found to be in violation against a rule that does not have a warning attached to it, so there is no opportunity to fix anything, it's just a serious enough violation that, sorry, we have evidence that you did this, we're going to issue you a citation. So whether it's a warning or not, and if you receive a citation, you have two days, I'm sorry, 20 days to do one of two things. You can either pay the fine or you can submit what's called a citation review request. And this is basically an appeal. So this is a form that you fill out. So you're gonna to go to our website, go to the compliance section that I just showed you. There's a button there for a citation review request. It's gonna pull up a form. You're gonna fill in all of the fields. You have the opportunity there. If you have evidence that you would like to upload as to why you shouldn't be found in violation, you're welcome to upload it. Once that's complete, it gets sent back to us electronically. You only know it goes through if you get a confirmation that it went through successfully. If for some reason you don't get a confirmation, something was wrong and we didn't receive it. So you don't wanna run out your 20 days and then be in a bad situation. So make sure that if you're going that route that you always get the confirmation. Um, so what happens to the fine? So every citation has a fine amount attached. So let's say that you submit the citation review request the fine is not going to be due at that time. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to temporarily withdraw the fine 
And then your citation review request, once it comes to us, we review it, make sure it's complete. We take that and all your information that you've provided along with our case information, we package it up together and it goes off to your association. And ultimately your association is going to review both sides and they're gonna decide whether or not uh, to uphold the citation that we have issued. If they choose to uphold the citation, they say, yes, CRMLS had enough evidence, this is correct then they're gonna let us know that. And then we will at that time reinstate the fine amount that's due and you'll have like another two to three weeks to pay it. Uh, if they find that we made an error and that there wasn't enough evidence to issue that citation, they're gonna let us know that as well. We're gonna withdraw it and then we're gonna, everybody's gonna go on their merry way. If for some reason you receive a citation and you don't do one of those two things, you either don't pay the fine or you don't submit the citation review request, ultimately it's not going to go away. Um, you could be eligible for suspension from the MLS where your service and your access will get cut off and you won't be able to do your work. So um, please don't ignore any communications that you receive from us. If you have questions, if you don't agree, whatever the case may be, go to that live chat and go in and say, you know, even if you don't understand, I don't know what I did, we'll explain it to you, okay? Okay, so here's the top violations that we're gonna cover today. We're gonna start with branding. So this falls under photo guidelines. And this reads, this rule is 11.5 and it reads that photos, virtual tours, and any media submitted to the MLS must not contain any branding or promotional information related to the listing broker or agent. So what is branding? Branding is identifiable information about yourself as the listing agent or your brokerage that is uploaded onto your listing in the way of media of any sort, whether it's a virtual tour, um, photographs, so branding is considered to be all of the following, agent, broker, brokerage names, photos, or logos on your media, phone numbers, website addresses, email addresses, um, messages or solicitations, text overlays, um, for sale and for lease signs, and uh, open house signs. So all of those things are considered to be branding because they are most likely going to be identifying you or promoting you as the listing agent or broker. The largest violation that we see with this has to do with yard signs that have already been put up in a yard and then the exterior photo is taken and then that photo is uploaded and there's the yard sign with all of the identifiable information that's considered branding. So we're gonna take that photo down and we're going to issue a fine of $100 for that. Um, if we take that photo down and it's your only exterior photo, then you're going to be responsible for uploading a new exterior photo that is not branded. That's going to generate a whole new case for us to be for us to open. So you've got to make sure that if you get notification and a citation that your photo has been removed, that you're paying attention, that you still have an exterior photo on your listing. When it comes to virtual tour, same thing. They can't contain any of the information that I just mentioned. Uh, the largest violation that we are the most common, I should say not largest, but the most common violation that we see when it comes to virtual tours has to do usually with when the tour opens and it's the agent standing there and they're introducing themselves in their new listing and maybe their brokerage. Hi, I'm Joe Smith. I'm with such and such brokerage. That's you're identifying yourself. You're brand, that's branding. So the whole tour, unfortunately, will be taken down due to that. The other thing we see with virtual tours is at the end of the tour, um, there might be a five or six second pop-up that just stays there that says, for more information about the uh, property that you just viewed, contact, and then there's all the agent's contact information. So make sure that that's not happening either. Um, YouTube videos. So when you're uploading a YouTube video, channel names are a big issue. You cannot use your name if you're the listing agent. Your channel name cannot be your name. Even if you don't identify yourself as a realtor, you cannot use your name. What we will do if we get reports is we will go to the listing and we will look, we'll page down and see who's the listing agent. And if that listing agent name matches the channel name on the virtual tour, it's branding. The whole virtual tour is gonna come down. So virtual to um, YouTube videos cannot have channel names with your listing, you as the listing agent, your name, team names or brokerage names. How do you get around that? Um, what we see agents do is they just create a new channel name for each property using the property address. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so rule 11.5 also encompasses um, copyright issues. This is a very serious violation, um, not just within CRMLS, but out in the real world as well. 
So this is a hefty fine. If you are found in violation of a copyright issue under this rule, it's a $1,500 fine. So it's very important to understand what's considered to be copyright. So this part of the rule reads that by submitting any media to the MLS, the participant and subscriber represent and warrant that they own the right to reproduce and display the media or that they have procured such uh, rights and all necessary licenses from appropriate parties. So that's a lot of information. So I like to break it down into two sections. So it has to do with um, production or creation or ownership origination, who originated those photos, and then the permission to use those photos. So we've given you three different scenarios here. Scenario number one is if you take the photos yourself, do you need permission from anybody to upload those photos? And of course, the answer to that is no, because you took them, you own them, you're the originator. You don't need to ask anybody's permission to use your own photos. Scenario number two is if a photographer takes the photos on your behalf, do you need permission to use those photos? And the answer to this is yes, even though you've paid for those, most likely, uh, you don't own them. The photographer owns those photos. They own the originals and you are going to need written authorization from them prior to using those photos. So do not upload the photos and then remember that you needed written authorization and get it from the photographer afterward because if it ever comes full circle and there's an investigation and we can tell when you uploaded those photos, versus what the written authorization is dated. If the authorization was obtained after, it's still gonna be found in violation. So make sure that you're obtaining your written authorization before you upload any photos, if they're not your photos. Um, as far as written authorization, so some photographers do have their own um, forms, contracts, whatever you wanna call them. We don't recommend signing those because most of the time it's going to, um, the written authorization is gonna protect the photographer probably more than it's gonna protect you. So um, we don't tell you not to, but it's just not recommended. There is a form on zip forms. It's called the PIA or the Property Images Agreement Form. And I have an example of it here in a minute or two. Um, this is one that we recommend that you use if you can. Some photographers won't sign it. In that case, then you're gonna to have to negotiate back and forth with what's considered what they consider to be acceptable. Um, but we do recommend it. Any written authorization that you obtain, you do not have to provide to us. You just keep it for your files in the event that we ever do ask for it down the road. Um, but the PIA form is simple. It protects everybody involved. So it's just the one that we recommend and it's on zip forms. Uh, third scenario is if you use photos from another listing uh, or another website. So you can do this, but it's going to take a little bit of work. So if you have a pre if you find a previous listing and you like the maybe it's you're listing the property again and you like the photos that were taken on the last listing, you're going to have to find out if you want to use those photos, who took those photos? Was it the previous listing agent or did they hire a photographer? So you're going to need to find that out. You're going to need to get the written permission from the appropriate party and you're going to need to obtain the original photos and upload those. Um, never ever right click and copy a photo from a previous listing or anything on the internet, um, even if you have the written authorization to do so. The reason why we will know that this happened is because when a photo is uploaded using an original to the MLS, in the bottom right corner, there's a watermark created. And all it says is CRMLS, and it doesn't impede your photo or anything. You can see right through it, but that's how we know, okay, that was an original that was uploaded. If you get permission even, and you right click and copy from that previous listing and you bring that watermark on that photo over to your new listing, now you're uploading that photo. Your upload is generating a new watermark, but you've brought the other one over. So now they're overlapping and we call it a double watermark. And if we get reports that someone is using my photos from a previous listing and I did not give them the authorization to do so, that's the first thing we look for is a double watermark. And if they're found, we remove every photo with a double watermark and we issue a fine for $1,500. No warning. Pardon me? No warning. No warning. Oh, that's not per photo, that's total. Total, total. But we will, we will take down all of the photos that are double watermarked. And we see it quite often um, that the entire, all of the photo, the slide deck of photos might be double watermarked, it does happen. So then all of your photos are gone and now you've got the issue again with no photos on your listing and all of that. So do not ever copy photos from a previous listing. You always need to use original photos. Yes. 
let's say I, I see a listing on Tulia Zillow. Can I use that one or not? You cannot upload that to the MLS. But can I upgrade, upload to my Facebook or Instagram? Yeah, we don't, yeah, we have no jurisdiction over that. So yeah, as long as you're not uploading it to the MLS, okay. you won't be in violation. If you have the permission of the previous listing key. If they, you need to get the original photos from them and upload those. You can't take them from a previous listing, even if they gave you authorization. You can't take them from an MLS listing to another MLS listing. The word mark is uh, can easily be moved. Pardon me? The original one. That's mark. still a violation. It's not the water. That's the issue. It's I mean, the uh, ownership. Copyright. Right. Okay, so moving on to can I use Google, Bing, Yahoo, Getty, or other third party images? And basically the same thing is no. Um, they are never going to grant you written permission to use anything off of their website. So the answer is just basically no. You cannot copy anything or pull anything from any third party website. Yes. If I have a listing last year, for this, I, I'm going to have it this year. Can I download it, everything? This photo is, I can get by myself. Should I take it this year? If they're, so the previous listing was yours and you, yes, you took yes. the photos? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can use those again because they're your photos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. But you still don't want to copy your own listing. Yes. Yeah. One, it's a, it's a shrunken version of your, so it's mm -hmm. going to be a smaller image. Mm -hmm. So you want to go back to your phone or wherever you got your photos from. And you still use the original. Because if you were to go to your previous listing and copy, pull that over from one listing to the other, we don't know that. We don't. We do at some point, but we initially just see that double watermark. So until we get into an investigation and then see, oh, it's the same agent, then that's when it's, yeah. But um, but you still need to upload originals. You can't pull from another listing. Oh, we can pull direct. If you could, if you want to copy the copy the whole yeah, listing copy. over, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, but just don't individually click and bring those photos over. But yeah, you can copy your listing. Uh, okay, so the biggest offender we see having to do with third party sites is Google. Um, it's usually Google Street View. If an agent hasn't had time to go out and take their required exterior photo, they go, oh, I'll just pull it up on Google Street View, grab that picture and, and upload it. You cannot do that. It's a third party image. Um, you'll get in a lot of trouble from Google. And then we're going to, if we find it, issue you a $1,500 fine. Same thing with Google aerial views, um, satellite views, map, you know, the map pin and the street names and all of that. You cannot upload any of those to the MLS. Okay, here's the property images agreement form, the PIA form that's found in zip forms. I turned that off, sorry about that. Um, exterior photograph requirement. So when uh, this rule reads that a listing must include at least one photo, can you know how to turn that off? I yeah, Locked right. completely out of it. I don't know why it's there. We go. Oops, sorry. Thank you. Okay, so this reads that a listing must include at least one photo of the exterior of the structure listed in the MLS. The compliant exterior photo must be added to the listing within two calendar days of entering your listing, and it must stay on the listing at all times for all statuses. Um, so basically, when you enter a listing, you have two days to upload an exterior photo. It needs to be a substantial portion of the exterior of the property. So it can't just be a front door. Um, it does need to show a substantial portion. It does not have to be the front of the property. If you like the, how the backyard looks better, you can upload the backyard. That's fine. As long as you're showing a substantial portion of the property. Um, it, your, your one exterior photo has to stay on your listing at all times. So if you close escrow, you can take off all the photos that you want before you close your listing, but you have to leave an exterior photo, one. Doesn't matter the status. It doesn't matter if you cancel your listing, if, you, if it expires, if you withdraw it, um, whatever you're doing with it, it has, you have to have at least one exterior photo at all times. Yeah. What is the reason behind someone wanting to delete the photo? Um, what we hear primarily, the most of the requests come from new buyers and they just don't want photos of their property on the MLS, or I'm sorry, on the internet anymore. We get requests from police officers, judges. Um, they feel like there's, it creates a footprint 
of okay. someone being able to know access windows and doors and that type of stuff. So there are exceptions for things like police officers when it's a real safety issue like that. Our legal department reviews it and they make the final decision. So I was told actually it was frowned upon to delete some of the uh, basically meeting this one point. It is. Okay. It is. But if we get the request and it's like I said, it's a um, well, rule 11.8. I don't want to say this rule 11.8 does not allow us to remove any information from the from a closed listing or a finalized listing. Um, we can't change any information because at that point, once it's been finalized, closed, canceled, expired, it's considered historical information within the MLS. So it's data, the photos are data, all the information is data. So once you close your listing, you can't do anything to it with the exception of those very few, like I said, uh, photo requests, photo removal requests. Now, the one thing that we can do if we get that request is we won't, re we won't pull the photos um, off of the listing, but we can turn off at that point at the request of either the listing agent or the listing agent's broker, we can turn off what's called the syndication button. So the listing will no longer go out to third parties. Uh, however, whatever has already been sent out is still out there. So something on um, realtor.com, if there's still photos and we've turned off our syndication feed, then you have to contact them directly and tell them, I want those photos off the internet, okay? So th that's as far as we can go. Uh, removals of photo, we talked about that already. These are just some examples of media violations. So the very top left, um, be careful what you're capturing within, I'm sorry, I skipped a whole part. I got, <laughs> I got sidetracked. Uh, when it comes to people on the, um, let me back up to that slide. And pets. When it comes to people on the, um, oh, way back. there we go. Images of people, um, children, images of children will be removed immediately. What we see usually if somebody does upload that is they're trying to um, portray how fun and clean the pool is. And so there's kids playing and splashing in the pool. No, you can't do that. Um, Pictures of people, basically we've all seen, you know, agents that capture them, their images in the mirror when they're trying to take a bathroom shot or what have you. Um, yeah, that's, that'll be taken down. The only exception to people um, in your photos would be if you, for example, were listing a beach property or coastal property and you wanna upload a photo of the nearby beach, there's probably gonna be people on the beach, as long as they're not identifiable, as long as their face is far enough away that somebody wouldn't say, hey, I know that person. Um, usually when they're far enough away, their face is kind of scrambled a little bit. If they're walking down the beach, maybe they're walking away from the camera, they have their back to the camera, you can't identify them. Those probably aren't gonna be found in violation. Same thing with animals. So if you're selling a ranch style property and the property maybe has a barn or horse stables and there's horses or livestock within the stables, that's okay because those, the stables and the barn are gonna go with the sale of the property, but just don't take a picture, an up close picture of a horse or, or an horse. ostrich or a selfie. <laughs> yeah, so just no up close photos of only animals because that really has nothing to do with directly with the property. Okay, let me go back forward. Okay, so examples of media. Um, be careful what you're capturing within your photos. If you're taking a picture of, or your photographer is taking a photo of a living room or a family room, there could be family portraits on the wall. There could be children in those family portraits, mom and dad, it might be a close up enough picture. You can identify mom and dad, whatever the case may be. Be mindful of what you're capturing. Don't just look at the room, look at the walls as well. Um, broker accolade, this plaque right here was uploaded as a photo. Um, I understand that the, agent wanted to say, hey, look how great I am. I'm gonna sell your house and get you all this money, but that has nothing to do with the property really? that's listed. Um, the third one over is watermarked, but this is watermarked from multiple MLSs. So this photo was used in multiple MLSs. So that's what a watermark looks like. The last one on the top is a Google photo. So Google has their own watermarks that they embed on their images. So if you look really close, every image has one. It's just it's usually the year of the photo with the Google logo. Um, you can find them, you can't really see, you can't see it on this one, but you can find them um, 
on the side of the house, in the road, in the tree, they'll be there somewhere. Uh, Google also does something where you, can, you can't really see it that well, but on the minivan, they split their images and then they put them back together, but they're very, um, they're off a little bit. So that's another identifying fact of a Google photo. Uh, moving down to the bottom, this gentleman, um, he, he was in the pool <laughs> and I, I don't know why someone would upload a photo of a man posing in the pool. Picture of the pool is fine, not the man. He very easily could have been identified because it was a close up and up picture. QR codes, please don't upload those at all because they have one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to lead back to contact information. The third one is some someone actually uploaded this as their exterior photo. So your photos need to be real, true life photos, not cartoons. Um, and then the last one is, of course, a Google aerial view. We can tell because of the map pin and street names and all of that. Okay, so moving on to inaccurate information. This is rule 8.3. This one's pretty self-explanatory. Just make sure that the information that you're uploading to your listings is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge, that you've put in some sort of effort to make sure that it's true and accurate. Make sure that when you're entering your listing and all those features buttons that you need to check off, that, they're, that you're checking off things that are true and correct as they pertain to the listing. Other things to double check, because sometimes the most obvious gets overlooked, Double check your bedroom count, bathroom count, square footage, garage space, map pin, all of those things that you think, oh, you wouldn't believe how many times they're incorrect. Mm -hmm. So um, just make sure that you're checking even the obvious. If for some, uh, for some reason we do find that you have inaccurate information on your listing, that does require a warning. And so we are going to send you an email and ask you, we're gonna be very specific and tell you, please correct, blah, blah, blah. And we're going to give you a correction um, deadline, de a correction date deadline. Can I pause right there? Yes. Maybe I'll show them an example. Sure. Okay. So, for those of you who who uh, you know, we we as a broker, I do understand how important it is to stay with the accuracy. So yes. I have an example of what one would looks like. If you've never received one before, great. That's that's the great on you. You haven't had a violation, but we have what's called a warning notice, and this is recently done a couple of weeks ago. So she was mentioning a warning, which is nice. At least they give us the opportunity to rectify the situation. And so CRMLS will tell us that we have a, a violation on the description. It says that the listing indicates their city lights views. Maybe you remember this one. According to reports received and based on the photos, there's no view of city lights. By inputting information here, the, we have to determine its accuracy. And then they give you what's called, please reply to the email and confirm. And please reply to this email and clarify if yes or no to the, if there's city lights views. You get a deadline. This is quick though. Don't forget, if you're on vacation, that's not an excuse. So you have three or two. four, two business days. Two days. Two days to respond back. So if you say it went into my spam folder, that's not an excuse because I get one too. And so they're going to blame me. Well, then your broker should have known. So, <laughs> and I'm fine I'm on vacation. That's very true. That's very, very if I'm true. on vacation, then, then you're the one paying the fine because you didn't get your inbox. You get this when you get someone flags you and reports you that there's a, a discrepancy in the information. You'll receive it in an email. It'll be an email. Now a citation. There, perfect. Um, now the citation is going to look just like this. So you need to be sure that where it says California Regional MLS at the top, that you're noticing whether it's a warning or a citation, because right there it will say the difference. Okay, so we do get phone or not phone calls. We do get people on chat that say, "Oh, I got a citation." No, you didn't get a citation. You got a warning. So you don't want to unnecessarily worry. Um, so just make sure that you're reading that it's a warning. If it's a warning, <clears throat> excuse me. Most of the time. Um, it's going to have some sort of correction notice for you. Warnings are okay. So, so uh, thank you for that mm -hmm. clarification. So, what do we do? I talk to the agent, and they, and then I help them. Uh, I guess we put together a response back, and maybe we can remember this. But um, just to let you know, you treat them people with respect. So, thank you for the warning notice. I appreciate CMRS looking into the potential violations. I understand your importance, and so I give them the definition of city lights view, which. I don't have the definition of seed lights from your from from the response, 
Uh, we apologize in advance if there's any error. CRMLS has full authority to remove the field of City Lights view if they desire better data accuracy. So anyway, we give an explanation. And then from our assumption and, and, and what we do in terms of this listing, it's situated on a corner lot with partial views of a commercial district area, Valley Boulevard. We reply and show pictures that we didn't think was relevant to the property, but it is about two blocks away from hotels, seven to eight story. So I didn't, we didn't use the photos of the, of the hotel in our, in our marketing, but it, it qualified as technically City Lights Views. So we labeled it as City Lights Views because um, we have that. And so we did that, get every definition and gave a, a yes or no. And then we have photos of street lights, of city lights, and gave a picture of the hotel at night and at day. So you can see this, the lights. That's a lot more than most people do. <laughs> Quick, quickly, what they do back, this is based on the photos you provided. They say it qualifies. As such, we have removed, if it qualifies, I don't know why you removed this from the field. We have removed the indication of city lights, yet the person says that it is no, they, appropriate. They removed the indication. Um, oh. So I, I find that a little bit of uh, contradictory that when they bless our yeah. description, yet they say and then remove it. So I don't have a gripe because this closed a year ago. Okay. But at, this, at the end of the day, there's people behind the scenes to talk to. And all they're looking for is data accuracy. They're not looking for you. This is coming from another realtor broker participant who's flagging it and trying to right. report stuff. Yeah. Okay. We do not, the compliance or CRMLS in general, we do not go into the MLS searching for um, violations. We uh, get about 3,000 reports a month and we are plenty busy trying to process those. So that was we, my question. Yeah, we do not ever, ever. No, never. One hundred percent of the reports that we get um, are, or I'm sorry, of the investigations that we do are reported. Okay. Yeah, it's usually other agents reporting. Okay, so moving on to there we go. Also under Rule Eleven, I'm sorry, Rule Eight Point Three is um, auto sold status. So auto sold happens when your seller has received an offer and you're going in to change the status after two days, because you're required within two days of an accepted offer to change the status to either active under contract or pending. So I'll stop right there. The difference between those two, because there's always a question about that. So active under contract means that an offer has been accepted by your seller, but they're still open to accepting backup offers. Pending is an offer has been accepted by your seller, but they are not entertaining any additional offers. So that's the difference between those two. So when you go in to change your status to one of those two, a mandatory field is going to populate its estimated close of escrow date. So you're gonna to have to enter that, that date, whatever it is that you've agreed upon in your RPA, but you need to keep an eye on that date because if that date comes and goes and five days pass and you didn't update that date, maybe, Maybe your escrow closed and you just forgot to update it. Maybe your escrow is going to be extended and now it's not going to close on September 30th. It's going to close on October 10th. You need to go in there and change that date. Otherwise, the system, if five days passes from the date that you entered, the system is going to close out your listing for you and you're not going to have access to it anymore. You're going to have to come to us. Um, you're going to know that this happened because number one, you're not going to have access. Number two, your status is now closed and there's a red flag next to your status. How you get it corrected is you come to us, we're gonna refer you to the compliance section of our website. And there's a form on there called the auto sold correction form. And so you're gonna to have to fill that out, send it to us, and then we will update your listing for you. So if it's supposed to be pending still, we'll put it back to pending and then you have access again. Um, so we'll fix it to however the current or correct status is supposed to be, yes. Actually, uh, this is the code one, but I call the listing agent. It's stationing under contract, but we close already. But she owns that. They India in the MRS, so I don't know what board they have. They said it's they sold already, but in the MRS, it's stationing under active, active under contract. contract. 
Okay. Um, on very rare occasions, it could be a glitch where the change didn't take place or it didn't update when the system updated. So that is a slight possibility. Usually though, it's operator error. So that would be something we would have to look into and figure out what happened. You, well, the listing agent is the, is the one who changes the status. So you're saying that it was still active under contract, but it closed? Yeah, in the MRS, is it closed? When you call them, they said, yeah, we changed it already. Here, you, you see the way. Here, us, the choice. Yeah, this so, I don't know what happened. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we would have yeah. to look into that. Yeah, yeah specifically. So that that's the red flag, the red flag means auto sold. So if you see a red flag next to the U for active under contract or the P for pending, mm -hmm. um, that means that you're getting real close to your auto so to it being going into auto sold. Okay, got it. Okay. And I do get as manager, I do get, you know, technology comes to the credit code because right. you know, this is gonna expire. So that's this that. right here. So we send you, we try and help you remember that date. We send you a lot of different inform a lot of different reminders starting at two weeks out. Then we send one seven days, one day prior, the day of your estimated close of escrow two days after, and then all the way up to that five days after. And if there, after five days, you haven't changed it, then the system's going to close it. And you'll have to go through the process that I just mentioned. Shelly, I have to leave right now. Yes, I, okay. I, I mean, my one kind ask is to share with them the rules on coming soon, to yes. register status. We're getting uh, to all of that. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Okay. All right, moving on, we have two rules left. Public remarks restrictions. So this is your property description field or your public remarks field. Um, remember that this is a public facing field. Um, there's certain information that the public should not be privy to. And it, most of the time it has to do with security issues. So in the property description field or public remarks field, however you refer to it, it should only talk about the property and the characteristics of the property. So you do not want to put in here gate codes. That should go into, sorry, that should go into, um, the separate field for showing instructions usually or private remarks. Um, showing instructions cannot go into the public remarks field. So what do we mean by that? An example is we had a, an agent put into this, this field, do not show the property, I think it was Wednesday through Friday from three to six because small children are home alone. Oh. Oh. Yeah. So stuff like that, you know, or, or, you know, you can't show the property between these hours because the seller's gone, nobody's home. And if that goes out to the public, that's a really bad thing. Um, compensation information, there's a separate field for that, obviously. Lockbox information, everybody can probably find a lockbox if they go to the property, but we don't need to be saying, you know, here's the keys to the property. Um, the, get that out of there. The, um, status of the uh, occupancy status of the property. Please don't note that it's vacant. I don't know why that's on there. Sorry about that. Anyway, um, please don't note that the property is vacant because that can also result in vandalism, things like that. No email addresses, phone numbers, or agent or brokerage information can go into public remarks. And the reason for this is because if you are a buyer's agent, and you're pulling up listings to send to your buyer and the listing agent's contact information is right there. Maybe the buyer can't reach you and they have a question or you didn't know an answer. And so they decide they're gonna contact the listing agent directly. Well, you could lose your buyer, you could. Mm -hmm. So that's why we don't allow that in there. Makes it a fair playing field for everybody. No open house information, there's a special field for that. And then no language that violates applicable fair housing guidelines. So there are certain terms and words that you cannot use in your uh, property description field. You can find that list on our website under that knowledge base. So go to compliance, click on knowledge base. There's the search bar, type in fair housing, and it's going to give you a list of terms that are okay to use, terms that you might want to be careful using, and then terms that you better not use because they will be in violation of fair housing. Yes. But that's under, um, that is not seen by the public. Okay, Those are, don't put it in, um, 
don't put it in the public remarks. Public remarks. In public remarks? No. Nope. Nope. No contact information. Okay, so where can you put your information? So the syndication field is going to copy whatever you have put into your public remarks. But in this field, you can add your contact information. You can upload a branded virtual tour. There's a special field for that. Um, you can put whatever basically you want to in here, but this gets syndicated out to third parties. And when they receive our listings, they pick and choose what they wanna use from our listings. So most of the time, they're not gonna include all that information. You might get lucky, but most of the time they're not. Um, but this is your opportunity to put it out there. Okay, last rule is failure to correct a violation. So this is rule 14.4. So let's go back to um, a rule that requires a or violation that requires a warning. So if we send you a warning and we ask you within that warning, we're gonna give you two days to make a correction, for example, and you don't make the correction, we then are going to issue you a citation. Um, within that citation, we're gonna give you another two days to please make the correction. If you still don't make the correction, we're going to move on and issue you a second citation for not basically listening to instructions in the first citation and making the correction that we asked you to make. So if you get one of these, you're gonna have two 